my dear listeners of today's episode. I want to use the opportunity to say thank you for two reasons. First of all, you are listening to my podcast and I'm so thankful from the bottom of my heart that I can bring some inspiration to you wherever you are. I was going into the data, there's a lot of data around, so I do have a lot of listeners in Indonesia, which I'm really very happy. Then I do have like really a large amount of US listeners. This is like, it's like a little present for me because I'm not an English native speaker. And of course, the Europe part is playing also a key role of my audience. So thank you so much that you're with me. The second thing I want to thank you is that um, you give me that space to develop because I'm not a born podcast expert. So when I started the podcast earlier this year, I had really to dig myself in how is it going with the IT? How do I structure it? What should it be about? And then more of all, I had to do the intro, this thing that I'm doing right now. And I really can, can say that it's for me like something I really don't, until now, don't feel really comfortable with. And I remember when I did the intro for Dave, that was the first um, conversation uh, that went, went, went online. I think I had to do the registration of the intro like 25 times. So for me, again, it's something where I can really feel I do, I do not feel comfort, comfort. But I'm a strong believer that exactly there where you don't feel comfortable, you might have to want to look in and maybe go for it because there is something you can learn. So this is exactly why I don't give up, but I'm here today. And I think I'm going to become smoother in doing the intros from time to time, from episode to episode. And again, I want to use the occasion to thank you so much for your patience. Coming to today's guest, I'm right now here in Ubud. Ubud is a little village. It's in the mountains of Bali, for those who do not yet know. It's also the place where Eat, Pray, Love, that Hollywood movie with um, Julia Roberts um, was set up. It, was, um, it, it plays here in Ubud. And Ubud is magical. It's one of the most beautiful places I personally know for myself. Uh, while arriving here, a um, storm hit me, so I had to wait and breathe because this is something I started to do when I'm like impatient and I wanted to go on, but it was not possible because when there is a tropical rain, it's just like streets turn into flower, into 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 rivers, not flowers. Would also be nice, right? Um, but like yeah, magic rivers, and I had to stop. So here I am, and I bring with you um, a beautiful conversation I had with Aaron. Aaron Zingbaia is born was born in a kind of middle class family in Vancouver. His dad is a TV cable installer, and his mom working as a community librarian. He is now one of the key um, impact entrepreneurs here in Bali. He founded four companies just in the last four years. But in his early life, he was one of the key figures for organization crime in Canada. He was deeply into drugs and, as he said himself, addicted to power, women and money. So um, in today's episode, and I think it's going to be really like an episode where you can listen to different subjects, we are going to touch, of course, his background, the organizational crime in Vancouver, the consumption of women, sex, power and money addiction and living a sex responsible life which I think is, is crucial for some, for the own health, right? Deep connection with other people, superficiality of luxury and other wealthy goods, martial arts and the power of willpower, ADHD and how to expand attention span. And I think a lot of us can relate to it, whether it's medically diagnosed or not. Then also how movies can have an impact on our own life. And one reason why Erin is here in Bali is because of that movie, Eat, Pray, Love. And no, it's not just a movie for women. So we will speak also about entrepreneurial lifestyle and becoming a serial founder, about the importance about being emotionally invested in what you do, the visions in life and on the world. And I think a subject that we can all relate to is the protection of children, in particular when it comes to children trafficking. And uh, last but not least, we will touch the subject, um, charity projects. So enjoy today's episode. It was a very long prologue from my side. Uh, it's going to be shorter the next time. Uh, I sent you my warm regards from, from Wood and yeah, enjoy. Let's start the journey with Aaron. It 
was so sweet because I met you because our common friend Dave said you should check him out. He used to be a truck dealer. <laughs> <laughs> and just shortly before you were showing me a presentation about a happiness project, doing good work, doing social work. So I said, wow, this is a kind of at first glance contradiction. So where does it come from, this truck dealer history? What is it all about? No, man. I mean, uh, it was a crazy time in my life, maybe about almost 10 years, actually, when I think about it now. From 17 years old to 27, I was involved in organized crime. Um, and I grew up... I, <laughs> it sounds so fancy. I was, it sounds really fancy. Oh, yeah. I was a recreational pharmaceuticals uh, consultant and uh, broker of commodities. <laughs> And I mentioned before, like, you look so healthy right now. Thanks. You look amazingly healthy, like, <laughs> shining. And I, like, what you told me, you were consuming trucks, something between fifteen to $20,000 That's how my, my, my habit. So I was a drug-addicted drug dealer, which is not, um, not good business practice. <laughs> um, but it was bad. It was bad news. But I was making, I was, I was doing, on the, the street price of my habit at the height of it, um, maybe I was 25 years old, 26 years old, it was 15 to $20,000 a month. And, you know, obviously I was getting it way cheaper because of, I, was, <laughs> I was in wholesale. Um, it, was, it, was, it was enough drugs to kill most people and mm. elephants. Mm. And so it was just really like, it was, it was hectic and my life was spiraling out of control um, because I was seeing I was masking my emotions and numbing with the drug use and it was not the healthy way to be living my life. Um, and I was spiritually poor, and I might have had cash money around me, but I was absolutely depressed inside, and I could see that I wasn't living my purpose. And then when I started studying, like, yoga and Buddhism and learning about Dharma and, and rightful, uh, rightful living, you know, I was like, oh, I'm not doing the right things here. This is why I'm so depressed. This is why I'm so unhappy. You know, I, I had the Mercedes and the fancy girlfriends and the fancy Louis Vuitton, everything, you know, and the fancy vacations mm -hmm. and all this bullshit. And none of it was making me happy. And I saw that actually, you know, contentment is not in reach when you're consistently looking for a shinier thing to buy. And I had to finally try to like, shiny up the insides of me. And then maybe that's why you see me shining today. <laughs> you said in our pre-talk you were addicted, not yeah. just to drugs, but to something else, right? Money, sex, and drugs. Oh, <laughs> the a good mix. Great combination. You know, great times. Mm. But, <laughs> again, contentment is not going to be mm. available when you're consistently reaching for shinier things, mm. including highs. And mm. I was consistently reaching for to feel better, to feel better, to feel better. And nothing was ever enough because I couldn't actually be present and sit with how I was feeling with myself. Mm -hmm. And acceptance of what really mm -hmm. is in this present moment was something I couldn't do then. And it's brought me so much peace now to just be totally okay with right now, mm -hmm. how I'm feeling. And whether it's a little bit, you know, a little bit slow or a little bit tired or a little bit this, it's like, okay, mm -hmm. you can just be that instead mm -hmm. of chasing whatever you can to, you know, speed it up or slow it mm -hmm. down or, you know, that was something that, um, took some getting used to and the yogic path really helped me be able to slow down. Mm. Yeah, it was important. Is it nothing was ever enough? I think many of us can, can connect to that. Yeah. Do you know where this nothing was ever enough feeling was coming from? Was it the environment that gave you that feeling like you're not sufficient, you need to do more? Where do your parents who said, do better, give more? earn better money, whatever. Where do you think it came from, this? It's also kind of limiting belief, right? No, absolutely. What's that? Is it, the, is it a Buddhist saying? But, um, like, comparison is the thief of joy. Oh, you know, you good. Know, you know the one? Mm. Something like that. It's true. Mm. <laughs> so it was really, I was constantly comparing myself with people around me, with pop culture, with rap music videos. I wanted to mm. be, like, one of those shiny dudes with the fancy car. And, and I became one of those guys with the fancy mm. car. And I had a Mercedes on 20-inch chrome rims. And I thought I was... What did it make out of you to be in then in a in a big, big car? You mentioned, like, your, your parents were, like, mid-class, middle-class yeah. in Canada. Yeah. So now you were there with this big, bang car. What was that feeling like? Oh, it's funny, actually. So my parents were lower middle class, normal mm. working class people. My dad was a TV cable installer. Mm. Um, you know, my mom was a community librarian. So they're like working class, <laughs> mm. like, you know, blue collar, great, good people, simple mm. people. Um, but, you know, looking at rap music videos, like I wanted to be a baller. And so 
I got this, I mean, my dad had a rocky relationship since I was about 12 years old. And definitely when I started hanging out with the bad kids and, you know, started, started getting involved in the wrong stuff, like me and my dad's, um, our relationship really separated. And so we had this adversarial, like mm. Mm. really rocky relationship between us. That was mm. like, yeah, it wasn't cool. We didn't like each other. You know, I was a little jackass and he was a hard ass. We were like, he asked me, he'd call me, he'd call me a jackass, you know? And, and I was secretly like, fuck you, dad, you know, constantly. Cause it was all that, like, um, that pain and, 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 uh, teenage angst. And so he had a, um, had a pickup truck, an older pickup truck. And one day I just remember pulling up my shiny white Mercedes <laughs> with the chrome rims and the cream interior an E-class that would just glide into the parking lot and I would, you know, um, hit the lock button and the mirrors would fold in and I'd be like, ha ha, like, yeah, you see that? Yeah, I'm a success dad. What? Whoa. And I could just see now just how arrogant and Whoa. ridiculous I was being. And I thought that was bringing me so much pride, um, you know, mm-hmm. whereas now I could see uh, there are some more important things I could have been doing, you know, but I had to go through it. I'm really proud I did. I'm really happy I did go through that because I could come out the other end and realize like hey none of that fancy stuff is going to make you happy you know don't be hustling and grinding for name brands when you should be actually hustling because you love what you do and you're helping other people and you're connecting and you're doing what people you love and there's some more than there's some some more than just you that you're helping and there's something Mm. bigger than you and that's been super super important lesson for me to learn and actually practice in any business venture that I take on now. How was your relationship to women at that time? Because if you were driving a big fancy car, you were really rich, you could invite women, you could make them big presents. <laughs> I don't know, you were looking very handsome in addition, good body. So how was it for you, like your relationship to women? Was it also like a consumption not only of money, trucks, was it also like a consumption of women? Oh, absolutely. And like, absolutely. It was, it was... I would say just as addictive as mm-hmm. the drugs and as everything else because I was an addict to validation. I was an addict mm-hmm. to sh- it was like sugar of all kinds, be it be it highs, be it um, with validation and affection, be it you know from from you know types of respect, distorted respect mm-hmm. I'd be getting. But I grew up the fat kid, like I was I was a fat boy. Mm. I, I no like I was, I was I was the ugly duckling. Girl. No I had braces. I had glasses. I had asthma. I had a gap in my teeth. I had a high pitched voice. I was the lowest slowest runner in the entire school. Like it was bad. I swear. This is really very very hard for me to imagine <laughs> right now. I promise. I promise. Okay. So I was absolutely not that kid, and I would always be the fat friend. Mm. So I was absolutely the fat friend. I would. Um, my best friend growing up was jacked. He was like the most handsome kid in the whole class. The fat, the most athletic kid, Ricardo from El Salvador. Mm. And <laughs> this guy had abs at 11 years old. Mm. Motherfucker. And so, he, you know, and I was the fat boy. And he, and so I would always tag along. I wouldn't get girls until 17 years old when I hit a growth spurt. I did roofing one summer, a whole summer of, um, in the most hardest labor job I've ever done in my life was industrial roofing. And I didn't know how much <laughs> digging was involved in roofing. I was so like, well, how am I digging on a roof right now? In, you know, 35 degree heat with hot tar all around me. And the, the tradesmen that you work with in roofing mm. are the roughest people that mm. they're, like, they're like meth addicts and alcoholics. Mm. Like it's the roughest trades, mm. um, you know, <laughs> possible. So I learned a lot that summer, really strange times. Anyways, I hit a growth spurt. And so I think I was like five foot six or five foot seven before that job in the, like maybe June of 2005 or four or something. And then when I, when I hit that growth spurt and I got, and I went to, you know, grade 12 year, the last year, I probably grew like two inches. <laughs> you know, I grew, maybe I was five eleven or maybe I didn't grow five inches, but I grew quite a bit. And I was like finally able to get mm-hmm. girls and I had all this new energy and new attention on me. And I'm finally, I was hanging out with the bad kids and I then started getting really mixed up in the drug dealing. Like, you know, as a little kid, mm-hmm. 17, 18 year old started getting, um, Ooh, be a bit dangerous and girls like me mm. Ooh, and mm. I started to actually get all this validation that was wow. so like like a drug you know really and I was absolutely irresponsible with my sexual energy and the amount like you know guys at, at you know that age 19, 20 are just trying to like as much as you can like yeah you know high five and all this like you know really um, immature distorted you know young masculine and mm. that 
was an interesting thing to go through and come out the other head, uh, other end now to see that I was treating that um, as another bandage for my own self worth issues. Mm. And so I just remember this moment having that Mercedes. We're in downtown Vancouver, and I had these three girls that worked for me that would like mm. pick up packages for me, and they're gorgeous. They had three girls. It was like Charlie's Angels, and so they would <laughs> they would do they would do errands for me, you know, in that, in that world. And they all worked at this restaurant called Cactus Club. It's mm. like a, a kind of like a hip restaurant everyone goes mm. to. It's a chain of restaurants in downtown mm. Vancouver. I remember walking across the street, and the, uh, the street, the three girls are following to my nice new Mercedes. It was one of the first times I had that new Benz, clean white. I parked it perfectly so everyone could see it because I was a total jackass. Uh, of course, of course. And I and they're all behind me, and they're all wearing high heels. So like, wow. I just remember hearing the clip clop, clip clop. Well, mm. these like three beautiful girls are walking behind me, and then I press the unlock button on the Mercedes, and the the mirrors fold out. Beep beep, <laughs> and then they fold out, and I'm just like. Erin, can your car get any sexier? And I just remember hearing that. And we get into the car, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I've made it, you know? And it was just such a funny, immature win. Like, it was such a little, like, stupid, um, you know, juvenile uh, win. And those girls, um, yeah, they were they were a big part of my uh, my ego. You know, I wanted to be the sexy man that... Um, that, that got, got the girls and it got me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Just, yeah, but at the same time, it was a very, very powerful position, yes. I can imagine, mm -hmm. particularly from where you're coming from, right? So I assume this powerful position itself, it's so difficult to leave that because now you are at another place, a totally another place. Mm -hmm. So how did you get out of that circle of addictions and also maybe change that circle of power um, for another circle for another lifestyle yeah with more values different values yeah absolutely you know it took it took like i said earlier before we started recording mm -hmm. was self-study was like one of the biggest practices in me and i had to really learn a lot about what you know what i wanted to do uh, who i wanted to be um what my priorities and values were and that's getting really clear and that's what i teach a lot in my coaching programs is hey what do you really want in life what are your values what do you what do you hold important what are your priorities And then the choices you make should align to that. And that's mm -hmm. what I had to stop and think. And I saw that the, the Cactus Club girls of Vancouver weren't weren't the girls I want to marry or be or like wanted to be around. They just they weren't the type for me. Then it was like, okay, well the type I wanted was a different woman when I first got to Ubud. I wanted the spiritual goddess archetype. I'm like, I'm gonna marry one of those spiritual goddesses. Yeah. Like, <laughs> feathers in her hair and all this shit. <laughs> it was like that's what I thought it. So then I was like, well Because wait, Eat Love Pray was your movie, right? Yes, you yeah, mentioned Eat, Eat, that. Pray Love was it. That Eat, was Eat, Pray movie. Love that yeah, way around. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. <laughs> And the Upa goddess archetype, like the, the yoga girl, um, mm -hmm. uh, was something that I was like, ooh, that's, that's the conscious. But again, how did that happen? Because from where <laughs> you were coming from, then suddenly finding a spiritual goddess as some attractive woman, yeah. this is a huge step. Oh, it was huge. It was so funny. So what kind of means, what kind of <laughs> self-exploration, what kind of self-studies yeah. did you undertake here? So it started off um, with yoga. And so yoga I, was the first step. Yes, yes, yes. I was a kickboxer mm. in Canada. I taught kickboxing. Mm, I love two. boxing. Yeah, me too. I taught kickboxing for six years. I got my black belt, you know, it, mm. from this one gym in East Vancouver, and it mm. was that was my whole life. And I, but I started getting too many too many concussions. Uh, I was getting too many injuries. Nobody told me kickboxing is bad for your body. To throw my body at your body mm. is going to hurt me. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm. But it's not good for you. And so I started doing a bit of yoga in downtown Vancouver in this like posh yoga studio in the nice area and I was like hey I kind of feel good after yoga this is kind of nice and I thought it was like my little steps into spirituality like I was a progressive human going to yoga because I was surrounded by gangsters and I was covered in tattoos <laughs> so I was like you know I'm different um but it was actually the gateway and I thank God for it that actually like hey that yeah, yoga was the mm -hmm. gateway into the pathway into a new life and new perspectives because then I was able to like come to Bali on um you know, trying to get away from the drugs and violence that I was in. And Because at that point, you were still a drug addict, despite you were drug addict exercising yoga, right? Yep, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was I, I was doing yoga and still and on drugs. I was going to yoga mm -hmm. while I was like on pills, painkillers, you know, having fun on my opiate painkillers. And, and, and Have you had someone external, like out of this criminal field, who said, Aaron, look at you, look where you are standing right now? Or did it really all came from within yourself, this shift? 
taking another road in life. Mm. Oh, do you mean like when I was really deep in it? Yeah. That anybody, yeah. No, no one, no one really tried to snap me out of it except my girlfriends at the time. Like one of my one of my girlfriends at the time was like, "You need to like you're doing too much drugs. Like you wanted to quit and you're not quitting. That's super unhealthy." You know, mm. like she she was trying to really help me out. God bless her. Um, For your parents? No, How they didn't know. I hid it. I hid it from them. And so a lot of most people didn't know, or they could tell I was like mm. they could tell I was on drugs. But also I was like, I you know I, I was making money. I paid for everyone's you know yeah. stuff around me. I was like it's the power. It was the power. So no one wanted to like tell me what to do because I was actually quite a, a functioning addict. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was a successful drug addict. So it's like, I mean, I thought me mm. making money was like I could do anything I wanted. You know, because like, I could do the drugs. I could be you know I could do that mm. as long as I'm still making money it's all good a functional addict I like that expression Super because high. I think a lot of, of us can relate to that yeah and then of course of the system is working yeah yeah mm. well it's working but internally you're burning yourself out mm. you know it's not yeah. good for your health um so where was it then we went to yoga I did yoga I came I, I needed a habit interrupt or a pattern interrupt in the world that I was growing mm. I was in so I went I did a black African plant group called Iboga mm -hmm. and it showed me like, hey, you can change your life and you damn should. And in the very uh, existential, ethereal, crazy, painful, horrible <laughs> circumstance. <laughs> oh God, I go look at so hard. Um, but then I came to Bali for a yoga teacher training where I came mm -hmm. out here to get clean, to give me a few months away from Vancouver. I was, um, and I and I did a yoga teacher training out here. It just happened to with this teacher named Denise Payne, who is like a hardcore yoga mom. Like she was a mm -hmm. she's a little five foot one firecracker of a person <laughs> who didn't take my shit. No one talked to me like Denise Payne talked to me, and she she would really tell me what's up, which I desperately needed. And but, you could t accept that you couldn't. You no, could not at really. that point, where you're still in resistance. I was I was absolutely at a huge ego. I was a total jackass at the time. <laughs> And um, and I was still a drug dealer. I was I was managing my my operations from Ubud in the yoga teacher training. Wow. You know, so it was just like crazy. I had my encrypted cell phone, and I was working in the back rooms uh, while they were like mm -hmm. teaching, and I would then be like, mm -hmm. you know, moving stuff across the country, and it was just like really, um, mm -hmm. really a weird world, right? Um, she failed me. She didn't pass me on that yoga teacher training. And she was just like, Aaron, when are you going to, at the end of the teacher training and the, the celebrations, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, there's the graduation day, mm -hmm. you know, mala beads everywhere. And she's like, I can't pass you, you know. Uh, wow. I can't put my name on your certificate. Wow. You didn't show up. You didn't really complete it. You were getting a full wow. sleeve tattoo the it's last pretty week. pretty cool from her. She's hardcore. Me and her are like best friends now. We talk every Sunday. She's like my yoga spiritual mom. Mm. And uh, I help her in business and she helps me in um, like uh, making through I'm living aligned with my chakras now. Mm. But yeah, the story then, she didn't pass me. I left like whatever, mm. it's fine. And I had to go back to Vancouver after Which is that. pretty rare, if I may say so, to not pass a yoga teacher training. Yeah. I mean... I think I'm the only person who failed the yoga teacher training. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> okay. And, and, um, and then I went back into the drug game, because, like, but I knew I needed to get out. So when I was leaving the plane to go back to Canada, I was like, I need to get out of here. I absolutely have to. What were the next steps? Because um, I know some drug addicts uh, myself, and I think it's very, very tough for them to get mm. that understanding that you reached at that point, and then yeah. to realize, to implement the next steps and to stick to them. Yeah. Because I assume there are days where you think that I cannot, and it's so easy to go back, comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's a huge thing that I, um, that I do with my coaching now is like actually plan mm. people how to whether they want to completely uproot their life and start mm. it over or launch mm. a business or both mm. and launch a brand and it's super important is uh, I had to make a plan. Mm. Uh, that was it. I needed to get extremely practical, write everything down, have my step-by-step -step plan of what I was going to do, how I was going to get out, all the things I needed to do under each one of those uh, steps and all the unpack all the parts of those steps and just start ticking boxes. Like mm. every day, what, what little step I'm going to take the box on and keep mm. moving forward and take all step those boxes. Step by step. Step by step is super, super important. I have a webinar on exactly all this of just like, mm. how are you going to get exactly what you want? And I, I go, I, I show them how I moved to Bali and how I was able to start opening businesses out here and how I was actually able to do all that. You know, and it was, 
it was really challenging because like the drug money wasn't coming in anymore when I, when I moved out here and I actually made, I uprooted myself and moved. It was a huge identity crisis. It was a huge mm-hmm. like ego shift. It was a huge like, oh, what am I going to do now? Haven't you saved money from your, from your truck richness? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. I, uh, when I came out here, I started over, you know, and I didn't want... From zero at that point. Not zero, not zero. I, I you know, I had some savings, but mm-hmm. I had to, um, I had to start making cash out here in a way that was honorable okay was so you had to rethink yeah. how to earn your money how to yeah. make a living with um a different way of income yeah and absolutely mm. i i would never make another cent that wouldn't make my parents proud mm. and that was super important to me and i saw all the karmic weight of what i was doing and just like that drug money i couldn't spend it fast enough and a lot of drug dealers do that is they can't spend it fast enough and i think like they, i mean they're not conditioned to save money that's not cool they they <laughs> live an impulsive life anyways so they want fancy bullshit so like yes but also subconsciously i don't think they want to carry it because they know they're getting it mm. in the wrong in the wrong way And I feel like that's kind of what it was like with me. And so like having that kind of cash um, in a way, yeah, I feel like it, the way that I, that you'd spend it is because maybe subconsciously you're not, you're not happy with how you made it. You speak about karma and mm-hmm. I think that's true. It's what you mean is like, where is the source of the money coming from? Right. And if it's coming from a good place, most probably to keep it easy, good things happen in your life, mm-hmm. but still, because you made it out from this dark place, What would you say are your qualities, are your traits, are what make you be different to others who cannot escape that circle? Mm. Oh wow. Is um, it the mental strength? Was it you were you were too much too you're too too down? Too much on the floor? You needed to do something, you know? No, um, what was it? It's probably a combination of all those. You know, mm. I would say the the willpower i think mm-hmm. i cultivated from, uh, martial art, from martial arts mm-hmm. i think i cultivated that from martial arts mm. um then there would also definitely be though i was at an absolute rock bottom point in my life that i had to change because mm-hmm. if i didn't change there was only a matter of time that i would have ended up ended up dead or in jail like because you've seen around you that people the, yeah, mm-hmm. a lot of people around me there was a lot of violence a lot of drug overdoses mm-hmm. just excuse me there was a lot of that happening and so it was um It was in desperation that I needed to make a shift mm-hmm. and change in my life. And I was so unhappy. Like, I just wasn't living my purpose. I could just see that. Like, hey, I needed purpose in my life. I mm-hmm. started studying a little bit more about purpose and, 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 and contentment. And I was like, this is not the life I want to be living. And there should be more to it than just this. And that's what I needed to, like, it was enough of a drive to, if I don't do something now, I'm going to, like, I'm gonna end up a loser. Mm-hmm. And that was such a actually what I was thinking. I'm gonna end up like a loser. I'm gonna be, you know, in my late twenties with no job, addicted to drugs. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like what am I gonna do with my life? And since then, have you ever gone back to the trucks? Was there was there ever a moment in your life where you say it was easier, it was more comfortable, or where the uh, where the appetite for being under trucks was so big that you um were close of getting back to the old person you once were oh yeah absolutely i mean i was i I think i had cravings for a good year like solid Mm -hmm. heavily cravings even to this day i'm five years clean now and it would be like like on certain stressful days you're like oh man i wish i i remember drugs (laughs) and like (laughs) oh i miss drugs they're so great and you think about it sometimes in, in ways like that um, then I remember just how far I've come that it's like my life is so much better now just being just being happy and vibrant and have mm-hmm. great people around me I've built a life that I don't need drugs mm-hmm. I don't even need like a few like I can have a drink here and there but like I don't need it like I'm happy enough and the people I'm around are fun mm-hmm. enough that like that I don't need drinking to mm-hmm. socialize anymore like I built a life that I'm so happy with that those little things mm-hmm. that help you numb and get by in my mm-hmm. old life like I don't just mm-hmm. like, I don't need them anymore it's kind of like Living in Bali, I don't really need sweaters anymore like I did in Canada because the environment around me doesn't need a sweater anymore. And you said as well, your environment here is social-wise is so different. It's so uplifting. It's so positive, Definitely. right? Yeah, absolutely. And we both agreed how important it is to really be clear on who you let into into your closer friends, who mm-hmm. you are surrounded by, because once you become the person um, of those personalities you have around you. When it comes to the power of money, and then you think back and you say, like, wow, money was easily easy to, to easy access easy accessible at that time mm-hmm. um how do you how do you view that money mindset today because now you're earning your money differently yeah oh absolutely i mean 
one thing I really think that was great coming from the from that hustler mentality mm-hmm. of the drug game is I know that if I put my mind to something and put in the work, I can get it. Like mm-hmm. I, I worked hard as it. I was good at what I did. I would find connections. I would s- sniff out who would be somebody that would be good mm-hmm. to work with. I would use my um, uh, discernment and, and perception to see if I could trust them or not. It's almost like psychic abilities. You have to know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. is this guy a cop? <laughs> or, or, like, will they will, are they trustworthy? And so it's like there's a lot of social skills mm-hmm. that I think really come from mm-hmm. um, black enter- black market capitalism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or, or even just, like, hustlers on the street selling newspapers or uh, stockbrokers mm-hmm. or whatever. Like, there's types of skills that come from any line of work mm-hmm. that you can bring into mm-hmm. something else. And I think that really helped me then come out here and open businesses was the skill of networking. Because I don't tattoo, but I own two tattoo shops. You know, I don't, I don't know how to use, uh, build a tech, tech anything. Even though I'm Indian, I'm not tech support. But um, the, uh, and, and you know, I'm, I own, I own a, I'm a partner in a personal development, online, online personal development company. You know, mm-hmm. put online courses and classes out. Um, those skills really help me in business to know that if I kind of grind as mm-hmm. they say but if I get resourceful enough I can make mm-hmm. things happen and that's what mm-hmm. a lot of being a drug dealer was mm-hmm. is just being super resourceful mm-hmm. I'm finding things I, I, you find ways to make it work that's mm-hmm. what an entrepreneur does mm-hmm. you figure stuff out I like that so much <coughs> because at the end you are transferring what you have learned in another business totally different bus- mm-hmm. business environment yeah. that you those skills you apply now yeah. and I think a lot of people forget that it's very often about that mindset, about the skills, mm-hmm. about what you already learned, and then just be able to recognize, oh yes, I can do something new, and 80% is what, what I've already done before. And those things I do not know, I maybe get someone doing it for me, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. The resourcefulness. Is yeah. like you can always find a way. And that's part of that full reset webinar that um, I was talking to you about, like that, <clears throat> that it's the steps of how to get there. And so mm-hmm. the six pillars are like, First, vision, like clarity. What do you, clarity and vision on what you want. So dream up the world that you want to build. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I wanted to be a Bali businessman. Mm-hmm. That's what I was doing before I left. Okay, cool. Breath work, uh, uh, you know, I get clear on it, clear my head, get, get into it. And then the next step would be something like, okay, what would I need to do? To, if, if that was it and I was a Bali businessman, what were all mm-hmm. the steps that came from before that? So work in reverse. And mm-hmm. it was like, well, I'd probably open up my business and I'd probably need business licensing. Then I probably need the business idea uh, or the, the, the plot of land and the renovations. And, I, need, da, 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 and I, mm-hmm. I go back in all the steps. Okay, great. Then it would be through that. It would be um, who do I need to know to make it happen? And that's like the resourcefulness of most entrepreneurs. Like, who did you? You need people to help you do your website. Mm-hmm. Do you need, you know, a, a book publisher to help you publish your book? Are you going to need immigration mm-hmm. connections? Like, what are you going to need to get those things happen? So then, it's who do you know? Who you know? And then it would be, what do I need to know to make it happen? Like, if I want to be a Bali businessman, what do I need to learn to actually make that easier? Mm-hmm. I was like, learn Indonesian. So I took Indonesian classes. I learned Indonesian in three months. It's the easiest yeah. language in the world mm-hmm. to learn. It's actually the number one easiest and language. And it's a beautiful language. It's mm-hmm. great. I love it. It's super mm-hmm. fun. It yeah. made my time here 10 times more fun. Mm-hmm. I have li- li- lifelong friends now that are Balinese mm-hmm. that I'm super close with that are like my brothers and, my, and, and like my family. And I can communicate effortlessly now with Indonesians mm-hmm. and have so much fun with it. Mm-hmm. And it made my quality of life like mm-hmm. skyrocket out mm-hmm. here. Great. Who do you need to know? And then the next step would be uh, make the first, do the first step. You know, it'd be like, actually, okay, what would your first step be? <clears throat> make that plan what's what what would you accomplish in this year okay then make out the timeline of those and actually like plan out what you're going to do from time to time um and put deadlines on it mm-hmm. and then the sixth step is do the first step mm-hmm. and that's like the six steps to get what you want and make some stuff happen out here practically i love all the manifestation stuff mm-hmm. like yeah it could be a bit fluffy to like i'm gonna manifest my destiny <laughs> But it's like, yeah, you can manifest your destiny. Make a plan and do it. Mm. <laughs> like that's how you do it. Mm. You make it happen. Mm. Yeah. I made the experience of manifestation in the last couple of weeks myself. It was yeah. so intense here, and today is full moon. Yeah, mm, as well. So the last yeah. days were really very intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we've spoken before also about your thirty third birthday yeah. that is coming, and um, <laughs> I would like you to repeat about. You tell me about your beautiful idea. <laughs> I'm really excited about it because I just kind of thought of this like two days ago two or three days ago and i was i was it i thought the day that we met mm-hmm. at the astana <clears throat> and and you came up i thought of it right then and there i was like uh maybe a, an hour before you came i'm like i'm gonna do this thing and my birthday's coming up i'm turning 33 on april 3rd and um i was like you know what would be cool to prove to myself for this year for my birthday would be 
how resourceful I am and capable I am at this mm-hmm. stage in my life. So I'm 33 now. What are all the resources that I have in my life? The connections, the business connections, the the know-how of how to create and generate a project to execute it. Um, you know, who can who can help me? How can I make the biggest impact possible? What would be a big goal to reach? And I was like, that sounds fun. And we did um, <clears throat> the Happy Mattress Project from Karma House, one of my businesses, uh, about 2018, 2019, around the time when we opened it, it was like a big charity push that we did was Balinese kids, a lot of them, that don't have a great place to sleep. Maybe it'll be like five or six kids sleeping together on the floor, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a shack. Just like their sleeping conditions are really rough. You know, mattresses are expensive and the people that live in the poverty line, they don't have mm-hmm. them. So it's a board. It's a wooden board with like a straw mat over it. Um, and when we saw those sleeping conditions, we're like, that is rough. Um, and we partnered with Bali Children's Project out here because they have a huge network of underprivileged children um, in really poor circumstances that could use beds. So they had this thing that they're getting mattresses for kids. And I was like, yeah, we can do that better. Like, we're going to partner with you guys and we're going to make it cool. So we like generated a big campaign out of it. Our goal was to do 100 beds in 100 days. We did 141 beds in 21 days. And we're like, great, oh, we nailed it. Yeah, we did really good that time. It was fun. <laughs> And um, since though, since then, it's been about two years now. Like, I think I've just become more capable. You know, I've met more people in in great. Um, I have more connections now. I've become more resourceful. I'm more connected here in Indonesia. I'm like, I could do things. I could do. I could do more than that now. And I thought, okay, so we did 141 beds in 21 days, being pretty good. Uh, you know, we did. We were pretty good. So now, let me see if I can do 333 beds in 33 days for my 33rd birthday, <laughs> launching on April 3rd. <laughs> And so you so, increased your target. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Increase my target. I want, and I want to also get like corporate sponsors. Mm-hmm. I want to be getting these kids school supplies, maybe desks, some desks to work on. You know, I want, the, I want to get them their bedding so they can have a good night's sleep and get to work or get to school. Sorry, I'm getting to work. And, <laughs> and, and that's exactly it. It was like that was, um, I think, seeing for my birthday this year, I don't want any presents. I don't need to get anything. I just want to be, I want to see how much I can give. Mm. And that would be myself love It's this a year. beautiful gesture, and at the same time, it shows how your mind is working because it's a very efficient, smart idea, well combined with the right tools of marketing that you need if you want to bring such an idea forward. Did you now getting back to to your former times just shortly? What did you do after school? Did you directly? Did you study anything? Did you? Did you have any any educational degree uh, mm. that you... No. No, I, I mean, I, I tried to do a lot of different things. And what I'm studying right now um, from this Dr. Gabor Mate from Vancouver actually is about ADHD. Mm. And I've seen, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. Just like I've never been formally diagnosed mm. with it. But studying this book and seeing, seeing. Mm. seeing all the earmark symptoms, I'm like, I think I have ADHD. And that doesn't mean I'm limited in what I can do. No. I believe I'm a highly mm. capable person. But it was. My intention span was really difficult. If I wasn't emotionally invested in something because mm. of having um, less than optimal ways of dealing with emotions growing up mm. in my developmental years, uh, it causes you to have short attention mm-hmm. span. So especially mm. if I don't like something, I'm not going to do it. Like I just, mm. I won't pay attention. So, you know, if school, I wasn't engaged in what I was learning, I just wouldn't want to be doing it. And mm. the things I liked, I'd get straight A's in. I'd be like super good at what I like. But mm. then when it came to, you know, like something like trigonometry or something mm. that just, I didn't see why it was going to help me the rest of my life. I was like, Meh. absolutely correct. And I think <laughs> yeah. that's, What makes you so beautiful because you're also a proof of you're a successful businessman with this excellent mindset. It's not necessary to sit at university and study mm-hmm. something that is very abstract. For you, I think it's like life has shown you certain lessons to learn. Yeah. And when I entered, I said, wow, you're just 33. Huh? <laughs> I thought you said that because I look way older. That's what I was bugging no, you. No, no, no. <laughs> Because uh, you have roughly outlined what you already yeah, did in your life, oh, you know. Um, so yeah, that the focus and attention span was super important to channel. Mm. And I think today in day and age, we're not being conditioned to have better attention spans. It's getting mm. worse and yeah, worse it's and worse. worse because we're not as emotionally connected anymore. And with social media and all these things happening in mm. society, we're less emotionally stable than we have ever mm. been. And being emotionally stable is what then helps us focus mm. deeper. Uh, that's mm. what the link in the book that, that I've learned now. Mm. So not being emotionally stable and you know having all these things, reasons to be anxious and all those is actually uh, like causing more ADHD and less focus issues, which mm. then in turn 
is helping us be, um, uh, causing us to be less present, causing more anxiety. And so what I've seen now is like study, like I said earlier, self study mm -hmm. is really what got me to where I'm at today. You know, and so I didn't get any university degrees, but then I really started studying um, how to have a better, uh, healthier emotional mm -hmm. and, and mental state. And so I started studying mindfulness, uh, mm -hmm. Buddhism, meditation, and, and then business and like, you know, books to help me feel more content and, and be more present in life and books on happiness and those changed my life because then I was able to see like, hey, actually I can read this, I can finish this book, I can be great <laughs> at it, you know, and, and I can launch businesses mm -hmm. and I can learn a thing that I need to learn and um, that's been, I can learn Indonesian because I was engaged in it and it made me happy. And so that was really uh, what mm -hmm. I seen then is like, if we're emotionally engaged in a task that we want to and we make it matter to us, mm -hmm. uh, we can far exceed our expectations. A lot of the listener might have that wish not to become a known entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What would be your best advice to them? If someone says, I would like to have my own business, where to start? What would be your answer? Um, it'd definitely be in the planning stage and research, of course, right? But it'd be like, is this something that you can make matter? Like I just said, is it something mm -hmm. that you're going to be emotionally invested in that you like doing? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people are super successful selling phone cases on Amazon or something like that. Or drugs. Sure, of course. You know, <laughs> And people like drugs. Some people are really passionate about it. I remember when I'd get like a fresh load of like 100 pounds of like the best, you know, triple A marijuana And you would just be like, this is a work of art. This is really good weed. And I would actually like hold up a beautiful big nugget of it and be like, this is art, craftsmanship at its finest. And I'd be so proud and happy about it. Like, mm. yeah, I love that stuff. It was just like, the, you know, excellence in any field is, should be appreciated. Um, but I digress. Uh, what were we talking about? The, uh, about where to start. And where you to said start. do Absolutely. something that matters and that Passion, you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, find something that, that you would feel passionate about doing, um, be it in any, in, in any way, shape, or form, and then make it bigger than you. And that's something mm, that I think really, Make it bigger than you. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I feel like that's the juice that keeps it going, because if it's just something for you to just make money, to buy shiny things, that can get old pretty fast, you mm. know, and, and it's not going to feel good for after a while. But if you have something that is bigger than you, that connects and helps people, and mm. you know, it's actually going to make a bigger impact than just mm. you, that'll keep you going on the days that you don't want to do it anymore. Because we wake up on the wrong side of the bed all the time. Mm. What's going to keep you, what's going to get you to get out of bed and go to work? You know, mm. it's like people depend on you, you care about them, or you're putting out something that matters, and, mm. and you're doing it for, for you know, a point of um, less than just superficial things, and that's a good reason to, to get up and do stuff. You're going to make a positive impact on the world. Yeah, it's going to make it more worthwhile to keep going. You know, you'll feel proud of your business. You'll be happy about it. I would have one last question, if I may. Mm -hmm. So you spoke about finding your purpose, which is challenging for a lot of us. What's then your purpose in life? And what is your vision that you build up on this purpose, your vision in life? Mm. Um, I actually meditated with this psychic when I first came out here. It was a super yeah. fluffy thing to do. She was amazing. Carrie Bradshaw. Shout out to Carrie. She, um, she meditated with me and would, you know, kind of, but a lot of, asked me a lot of questions too. And it would be around what I needed to do in life. And, you know, what came up for her and that really rang true for me was I need to live by, um, compassion. I need to live by connection and inspiration. I need to give, connect, inspire. And that, that would make me happy. And that's like my tagline. That's my motto. Give, connect, inspire is what, um, if I'm doing things that align with those three values, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's really important. And so I also had advice for anybody starting out that wants to figure out what to do, get clear on what your values are, get mm -hmm. really sit, meditate and get clear. What, what are three words that make you like ring true about you that you need to live by those things, you know, is it joy? Mm -hmm. Is it dance? Is it, mm -hmm. Is it love? You know, what are the things that are going to make you like, okay, cool. And mine was, I need to make a positive impact on this world. I need to be compassionate and help others. Uh, I need to inspire others because I love teaching and I love to right. be somebody that can, you know, s flick on that light for other people. Right. Right. Um, that feels really good for me to actually help inspire people. And then, you know, connection. Connection is something I live by. If I, I need connection in my life and I could see how much depression was, was coming up and creeping up on me when I was disconnected from myself and others with authentic connection. Mm. You know, the superficial drug game is not real love and connection. So taking time to really actually develop deep, close mm. ma friendships that matter mm. is it, so, so mm. valuable and so mm. underrated right now. Mm. Um, and my vision 
is, uh, yeah, I want to continue on this path of building businesses I love, mm-hmm. uh, connecting across the world, mm-hmm. inspiring others, putting out content, write books. I need to write a life story at some point. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. I'm coaching right now and I'm really enjoying coaching and people, getting people out of you know, high risk, high money situations like uh, organized crime members and getting them to make social impact. Oh, and that's like what I'm passionate about right project. now is I'm coaching people. It's full reset coaching. It's not just for drug dealers. A lot of my clients mm-hmm. are totally normal. One of my clients is... Um, is a, a PhD student in the in Toronto and you know wants to stand up for women's rights in the Muslim community because she was like you know uh, heavily oppressed and I'm like yes like that's those are my people I want to be helping people transform their life build their brand and inspire others and make it monetarily successful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so the vision of that is to continue coaching and then start really really coaching change makers and making mm-hmm. something really big out of that. I do have one last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's your vision on the world? If you would change the world, if you would be able to change the world, where would you start and why? Oh, wow, that's a deep question. Oof. Where would I start and why? Um, I would have to, it'd get a bit dark, but I would have to protect the children that are being trafficked. Mm. I would have to be there and help all the kids that are in those situations that are absolutely uh, not their fault. They have no control and their lives are being warped into very sick, you know, horrible, disturbing things because um, children are our future. And you, we know how much it can really hurt to not have the basic necessities and even then forced against your will to be doing things that it's going to ruin your life. You know, it's, it's going to take a lot of work to bounce back from that if you can. And so mm-hmm. that's exactly where I would be starting would be um, ending, mm-hmm. ending any child trafficking and any violence against children because like they're, those are the kids that are innocent and mm-hmm. those are the kids that need help and that's exactly where I'd want to be uh, making an impact and um, making a, an example out of the people who, uh, who deserve it mm-hmm. yeah. sorry well, about a bit dark <laughs> no it's a good it's a very good ending because okay. it shows as well that I like to go into the dark as well because mm-hmm. it's there yeah? yeah so I'm a big fan of keeping both on the table Mm -hmm. and um, it's a very good vision it's a very great vision thank Mm -hmm. you so much I really enjoyed the conversation was taking me into other dimensions (laughs) I really really enjoyed it (laughs) thank you thank you for having me it's quite a good time you're so easy to talk to and I appreciate it and um, I hope everybody listening enjoys it This was a very motivational, inspirational talk, I can say at least, about a various list of subjects that we could uh, touch in that talk. So um, when you feel like, I would like to invite you to have a look on on Aaron's uh, Instagram account and also his homepage. We will put everything in the show notes. I would like to also bring up here again, please feel free to review. I'm really looking forward to read all the reviews. Do them ideally on the Apple uh, podcast. I think this is a great forum for it. If you are not an Apple user, go on our YouTube channel and also on Instagram. We will post today's episode. So please feel free to share your ideas, your thoughts, what you could take away or whether you have any further questions for Erin or for me. And I wish you now for the rest of the day, just a beautiful ending. And never forget to keep on shining. Yours, Corina Rosa. Mm-hmm.